Government-wide mobilization is activated for the first time in a drill today. Hong Kong's population fell almost 70,000, or 0.9%, last year. U.S. Defense Secretary explains stance on shooting down balloons. Hello and welcome to TVB News. The government held its first emergency drill that involved the activation of a government-wide mobilization. The exercise involved some 10,000 civil servants, with 900 workers being mobilized to designated marshalling points. The administration said preliminary reports show all personnel called upon reached the sites on time and the drill did not affect the government's daily operations. Jackie Lin reports. A dismal state at COVID hit housing estates under lockdown during the start of the fifth wave of the COVID pandemic, precipitated by a shortage of government staff. Government manpower crunch also led to chaos and confusion in isolation arrangements for COVID patients. To bolster the government's emergency response capability, chief executive announced in the policy address that a new government-wide mobilization would be added to the existing emergency protocol. Around noon today, the government held its first drill, simulating the response management on a tsunami happening around Hong Kong waters. Civil servants had to help with evacuation efforts near low-lying districts. Here at the North Point Community Hall, the central coordination site, where 300 civil servants needed to reach within three hours. Another 600 had to arrive at various marshalling points of their respective departments. Some 10,000 government workers in total received emergency alerts. The government says speed is of the essence in today's drill. This is different from the normal drills. So this drill is about communication. It's about the, how fast the colleagues can be called out. The government said more than 70 government bureaus and departments roster their personnel over three shifts, with 10,000 workers allocated per shift. Each department has to notify roster staff about the emergency situation within one to two hours to cope with major incidents that require deployment of considerable manpower. Probably it's very extraordinary, whether it's a pandemic like the COVID or whether it's natural disaster or whether it's some other major, major um, happenings. So the, but the call out point is it, for sure, we have to be effective. All civil servants involved in the emergency response efforts will wear this blue vest for easy recognition. Authorities would review the different work areas of the drill and present them at the Legislative Council next month. Jacqueline, TVB News. Hong Kong's population continues to drop, with the city reporting 7.33 million at the end of 2022. That's a year-on-year -year decrease of around 68,000 people, or 0.9 percent. The SAR reached its peak population at 7.52 million in 2019, before experiencing a decline for three consecutive years. Hong Kong also experienced a net outflow of around 60,000 residents in a migration wave last year. With 32,500 births registered in 2022, the SAR faced a record low in annual births since the data became available more than 60 years ago. Meanwhile, an estimated 62,000 people died last year due to reasons including the COVID-19 pandemic. And Hong Kong's latest unemployment rate dropped to 3.4 percent, which is the lowest over the past three years. The number of unemployed was reduced by 0.1 percent, or 7,600 to 118,400 people during the period of November 2022 to January 2023, when compared to the period of October to December 2022. According to the Census and Statistics Department, the unemployment rate of most sectors, particularly for the construction sector and retail sector, saw a decline. Meanwhile, the underemployment rate also decreased from 1.5 percent to 1.4 percent during the same period of time. 
The Labor Department said the labor market conditions will be further improved given Hong Kong has fully resumed travel with the mainland and the city's economic activities have gradually returned. The office of the ombudsman criticized the government for failing to take adequate enforcement against unauthorized construction in the new territories, as well as illegal obstructions on the city streets. The office made several recommendations, including the use of progressive fines in a bid to deter further offenses from being committed. Timothy Lee reports. Beginning in April of 2012, the government began a campaign targeting illegal building works that ran rampant in the new territories, provoking the ire of the rural communities. The anger was also directed towards former chief executive Carrie Lam, who was then secretary for development. A decade has passed, the office of the ombudsman found the enforcement authorities' work still unsatisfactory, citing that only 40 percent of the city's 42 villages were inspected by the building's department in that span of time. Despite issuing over 5,300 removal orders, the building's department reported that up to 37 percent of offenders failed to comply. Things have not fared much better for the regulation situation of the illegal occupation of streets by goods and miscellaneous items. Between 2018 and 2021, the Ombudsman's office conducted at least four daily inspections of black spots, including Shamshui Post Shunning Road and Yikok Street. The office found offenders were charged in only 0.1 cases and fixed penalty notices were only issued in 0.3 cases on average per day by the Food and Environmental Hygiene Department. What we can see is that during this past decade, there have been multiple inadequacies in terms of its implementation. Even though the uh, enforcement action has been stepped up, if the compliance of the removal order uh, is not as high as expected or should be, then there sends a message that whether that prosecution and enforcement policy is credible. Chu provided several recommendations to step up the enforcement effort, such as publicizing conviction cases on a wider scale, introducing a progressive penalty system, and strengthening the training for frontline staff. Regarding the regulation of the illegal obstruction on streets, the Office of the Ombudsman suggests that the Food and Environmental Hygiene Department should be given the authority to remove or seize items causing these obstructions as a strong deterrent. Timothy Lee, TVB News. In Hong Kong's largest national security trial, former lawmaker Ao Nok Hin continued to testify against fellow Democrats. Taking the stand as an accomplice witness, Ao said after the coordination meetings among different geographical constituencies, the Democrats reached a consensus in four areas. They include confirming to organize the 35-plus unofficial primary election, plan out a list of designated reserve candidates, and hold an election debate. But Ao said some Democrats at the geographical constituencies could not agree on the details and wording on the idea of vetoing the government budget. The Foreign Affairs Committee of Beijing's National People's Congress condemned a U.S. House resolution over China's balloons. In a statement, the NPC said the recent resolution passed by the U.S. House was malicious hype and political manipulation, adding that China, as a responsible country, always adheres to international law. The NPC reiterated that the nation has no intention to violate the territory and airspace over any sovereign countries. On Wednesday, U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman said the Chinese balloon was not a weather balloon. And she stressed that there are no U.S. government balloons over China. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said the U.S. military has recently made adjustments to its radar and hence was able to collect data on slow-moving objects like balloons. This report from NBC News. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin sitting down for his first interview since the U.S. shot down a Chinese spy balloon and then three other flying objects over North America. Has anyone claimed ownership of the last three? No, they haven't. The intelligence community now believes those three objects were not hostile, but Austin defended the recommendation to take them out. The safety and, uh, and security of the American people uh, is always foremost in, in our minds. The decision, he says, made because the objects threatened commercial aviation and may have been collecting intelligence. 
objects like these likely over U.S. skies for years, but going undetected. Is this something that the American people have been potentially in danger from for years and just not known it? We don't know if, uh, you know, how frequently these, uh, these things may or may not have have uh, appeared in our airspace. Uh, we're learning a lot more about that. The fact that the U.S. military didn't know about these until recently, is that an intelligence failure? Was that a military failure? No, I, it's, it's, it's how you use your radars. They recently made some adjustments on their, on their radars and opened up the aperture and they're analyzing the data a, a bit differently. Uh, we typically are focused on things that are moving fast and, uh, and uh, it, so it's a bit more difficult to collect on slow moving objects like a balloon. China today again insisting that its balloon flew over the U.S. accidentally and that in response to new U.S. sanctions, it will, quote, take countermeasures against relevant U.S. entities. Austin acknowledged recent tensions with China have halted communications with his military counterpart. When something happens, they somehow uh, tend to shut down their military channels of communication. I think that's dangerous. Uh, but it won't stop me from continuing to encourage them uh, to open up the lines of communication. I think that's the right thing to do. Coming up, first local school with mainland curriculum to be set up. A few months after the rise in plastic bag levy, what has changed? Welcome back. There have been further rare rescues of people in Turkey following the earthquake nine days ago that has killed over 41,000 people there and in Syria. But the emphasis now is on the recovery of bodies. Matthew Bray reports. This footage purports to show a 13-year-old boy pulled from the rubble of a destroyed building in Antakya more than 228 hours after a deadly earthquake hit southern Turkey and Syria. But the emphasis is now on recovery of bodies as rescues like these are few and far between. Many survivors are homeless in near freezing winter temperatures. <laughs> this man says he is waiting for his mother to be found from the rubble of a building. Is it possible for us to leave without her? It is not possible, he says. This woman has been living in a small park since the quake struck. She is waiting for a tent. The rich, they take the car and leave. The non-rich will stay put. We can't do more, she said. In Syria, conditions are hardly any better. This woman was one of the luckier ones to make it to a functioning hospital. Her daughter didn't survive. Elsewhere, residents of Latakia were just trying to pick up the pieces on what was left from destroyed homes. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad was seen meeting the Jordanian foreign minister. Assad is seeking to make political capital out of the earthquake in order to break Western sanctions and ease Syria's diplomatic isolation. Jordan is a staunch ally of the United States and has sent large shipments of aid to both Syria and Turkey. Meanwhile, back in Turkey, the country's disaster authority said the death toll had risen to over 36,000 and added there had been 4,300 aftershocks since the initial tremor. Matthew Bray, TVB News. Six Russian balloons were spotted over Kiev and most were shot down. That information was revealed in a statement by Ukraine's military, which has also said the country has been hit with a barrage of missile strikes in the last 24 hours. These are shots of air defense traces above the Kiev sky. A, Ukraine, a Ukrainian Air Force spokesperson told local TV that Russia could be using balloons to preserve stocks of drones. Russia did not confirm the allegation. Scottish leader Nicola Sturgeon resigned yesterday after more than eight years in office. It was speculated that she stepped down due to pressure concerning a proposed new gender law. But Sturgeon failed, her, framed her resignation as a moment to bolster the cause for independence for Scotland. Tracy Furness has more. A surprising announcement by Scotland's leader Nicola Sturgeon at a news conference Wednesday. She was stepping down. Since my very first moments in the job, I have believed that part of serving well would be to know almost instinctively when the time is right 
to make way for someone else. I know that time is now. That it is right for me, for my party and for the country. And so today I am announcing my intention to step down as First Minister and leader of my party. Sturgeon has led Scotland's devolved government and the Scottish National Party for eight years. She came to prominence when her predecessor Alex Salmond resigned after a failed referendum in 2014 for Scotland to leave the United Kingdom. A recent attempt for a second referendum was vetoed by Westminster. A challenge in the Supreme Court last year found Scotland could not hold a referendum without the consent of the London Parliament. In recent weeks, Sturgeon came under pressure after she pushed the Gender Recognition Bill through the Scottish Parliament over the objections of some members of her own party. This raised concern that Sturgeon's position on transgender rights could undermine support for independence, her party's overarching goal. But British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak paid tribute to Sturgeon. Well, let me first start by paying tribute to Nicola Sturgeon for her long-standing public service. I wish her well in the future. Well, I've consistently said that I think what people in Scotland want to see is their two governments, the Scottish government and the UK government, working constructively together on the priorities that really matter. Sunak went on to say he looks forward to working with the next First Minister of Scotland. So far, the identity of Sturgeon's successor has yet to emerge. There is no obvious successor. There is no obvious person who has the charisma of Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Salmond who uh, might be able to do the job. Sturgeon said she will remain in office until a successor is elected. Tracy Furness, TVB News. New Zealand stepped up recovery efforts after Cyclone Gabrielle left. At least five people dead and displaced 9,000 in the country's most damaging storm in decades. Gabrielle, which hit New Zealand on Sunday before making its way down the east coast of the North Island, cut off entire towns, washed away farms, bridges and livestock and inundated homes. Roughly 102,000 people remain without power, down from a peak of 225,000. New Prime Minister Chris Hipkins has told New Zealanders to prepare for the likelihood of more casualties. Back locally, the city's first school offering a mainland Chinese curriculum is set to open by 2026. The site of the future school, which will offer both primary and secondary education, is located near the Hong Kong Wetland Park in Tin Shui Wai, with a campus set to be built on top of an empty plot of land. The facility will be operated by Yu Chung Yu Wa Education Network. The Education Bureau said the group is the most suitable applicant for a private institution to offer the mainland curriculum. After the new plastic bag levy took effect on December 31st last year, a survey conducted by a local green group has found more fruit and vegetable items were wrapped in plastic at some supermarkets but use of flat-top plastic bags has recorded a significant drop. Christy Kahn reports. Addressing environmental concerns, the government implemented a new plastic bag charging scheme last December, doubling the levy from 50 cents to $1 per plastic bag. Also, exemptions for some food items have been revoked, aiming to further discourage the use of plastic bags. Under the current scheme, only food items which are without packaging or not wholly wrapped in non-airtight packaging are exempted from the $1 levy. Greeners Action, a local green group, conducted a survey at 54 supermarkets in Hong Kong between January and February. The results show that the number of flat-top bags distributed at cashiers has seen an 89% drop compared to last year's study. And the number of carrier bags recorded a significant drop as well. This time uh, we have uh, uh, obtained a 45% of reduction of the uh, carrying bags just because uh, double from the 50 cents to one dollar. I think uh, the result is quite, quite good. The group also said the situation of over-packaging gets worse in some supermarkets after the implementation of the new plastic bag charging scheme. More fruits and vegetable items are being wrapped by plastic in different forms. 
we find that uh, it is quite alarming uh, situation so that uh, we can see 76% of all the items in supermarkets are wrapped so that uh, I think that it is related to the uh, later, uh, latest uh, legislation. The group said supermarkets may have decided to wrap more food items in order to avoid confusion to customers. They called on the governments to introduce new legislation to address the overpackaging issue. Christy Khan, TVB News. That's the news. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.